My mage built in Elden Ring was already incredibly powerful, but to truly uphold the title we need to optimize it. We're in the late game now and you will notice that the game starts to ramp up in difficulty after you defeat a certain boss. Just spamming the early game spells or the mid game terror known as Comet Azer will not cut it most of the time and we need to adapt to circumstances or you might just simply fail in the late game. In this video I will show you the most optimized and powerful mage build for the latent endgame and I will also go over the recent patch and with that the many changes to sorceries and what it truly means to us. Let's start with the optimal stats you will want to work towards too. If you don't have 60 intelligence yet, get that as soon as possible as a mage. After 60 intelligence, diminishing returns start to kick in, but we will want to get 80 intelligence to get soft capped. Between 60 intelligence and 80 intelligence, it's also useful to get a point of mind or vigor for every point of intelligence that you get, as the increases are relative and diminishing returns have not kicked in yet for mind or vigor. At 80 intelligence you are soft capped and for the rest of the entire late game don't even worry about the stat anymore. After that you will want to get to the point where diminishing returns start to kick in for both vigor and mind. This is around 40 for vigor and around 60 for mind. If you are dying a lot then you can prioritize getting vigor soft capped after intelligence and get it all the way to level 60 and get mine to somewhere in the 40s and you'll have plenty of fp as well that way which is also just a good tip in general if you struggle a lot then definitely get more vigor at any point in the game really even if you are not soft capped on intelligence yet the other stats that are relevant are endurance and dexterity and i would prioritize endurance after the three i just mentioned over dexterity if you have points left just for the reason that it makes chain casting easier as well as give you a higher equip load which means better armor possibilities however in my opinion neither endurance or dexterity are really crucial for a mage which is why i never spend points on them it's just extra quality of life essentially and we will also get relevant points in several stats through our talismans that i will talk about later in this video so whether you want to spend actual points into endurance is going to to be a personal choice for you. Our flask of wondrous physic needs to be upgraded as well. I did the comparison between the intelligence hypernode and the magic shrouding crack tier for various intelligence level after level 40 and the magic shrouding crack tier essentially out damaged the intelligence hypernode at every single intelligence level. Here are two examples. The first one is around level 60 while the second one is around the soft cap. So the reason we are seeing this is due to the fact that the magic shrouding crack tier gives you a bonus of 20% extra damage which is a percentage and thus a relative bonus. While on the other hand the intelligence not adds 10 flat levels to your intelligence and therefore might be better in the early game but it's just going to be worse and worse as you progress to the point that it will not be a relevant flask component anymore when you soft cap on intelligence. Thus you will want to get the magic shrouding crack tier for sure. For this you will want to go to the minor air tree in the northeastern part of Lernia of the Lakes. Kill the Erdtree avatar and he will drop your magic shrouded crack tier and you'll get a bunch of other elemental crack tiers as well by the way so definitely a boss you will want to kill. Combine it with our powerful cerulean hidden tier in the flask and now you have for certain the most powerful flask for a mage. Now that we have our flask optimized we need to talk about something very important. Sorcery. There are still a bunch of powerful spells to pick up or that we need to start using now, now that we are in the late game. The first of them is going to be the Stars of Rune spell. This sorcery is incredible in the late game, not necessarily even because of its damage output, but rather because of its unique tracking capability. In the mid game, this spell is not that relevant, just for the simple reason that most enemies don't move as much as the ones in the late game and because you don't have that much FP yet to really justify its high FP cost. In the late game though this thing is incredibly good. This is mainly due to the reason that some bosses that you are going to fight have had too much crack cocaine and can barely stay still or stay in one place and therefore this spell provides the ultimate solution to that problem. Furthermore with the most recent patch its FP cost has actually been reduced so it's gotten even better now. Definitely pick it up, you can get it in Celia's Hideway. When you proceed through the cave you will ultimately find Lucid. There are some hidden paths in this cave so be wary of that. But when you get to Lucid he won't talk to you in similar fashion as to when we met Azer but he will give you the spell and that's all that matters. 
Now we also want to pick up both of the legendary moon sorceries, A because they are legendary and more importantly B because they are actually also really good to use. You can get Renella's full moon sorcery just by simply turning in your remembrance that you got from defeating Renella at the round 12 table and then choosing it. If you already used your remembrance for the staff and think you are doomed, don't worry because you can still get it, just watch my other video on how to do that. For Renny's dark moon we want to go to Shalona's rise, this area is probably familiar for you if you did Renny's quest chain, which you should have definitely have done by now. When you get to the tower right here, you will need to do one of those turtle killing quests again. The turtles are really spread out this time, but I've marked them for you on the map, so just go to these three locations and you will find them and they are stationed a bit weird this time some of them are even floating but you will find them if you go to those three locations then you can go back to the tower and the seal will be gone go to the top of the tower and there will be Rani's dark moon that you can pick up congratulations you now have both moon sorceries you now have very good options for AoE damage spells that also apply a debuff on your enemy that reduces their magic negation stat. So that means you will deal more damage. Especially Rani's Dark Moon is nice to use because it also builds up Frostbite. So first it applies a debuff to your enemy and reduces its magic negation with 10% and that gets stopped with another 20% when you apply the Frostbite on your enemy. So that's 30% less magic negation on your enemy just from this spell. And that's a very nice debuff to apply. Now we want to pick up both the Cannon and Gavel of Hema spells. For this you have to do the quest related to Torps and you can find him in the Church of Irrit. The quest is really short and he will ultimately teach you the erudition gesture and with this gesture known you will want to go to the converted fringe tower. The best way to get to this place is to approach it from the north, go to the grand lift of Dectus Grace Point, then go south till you arrive at the village that's located there and from there onwards go to the east and you will be able to see the tower from a distance and you can just go towards it. There's also a madness debuff on the way though so be careful for that but it should not be too bad. At the tower you want to break the seal open with the erudition gesture that you got from the quest and you will have to wear a glintstone crown helmet in order to do so there are a bunch of these in the game and luckily we did pick up a few at the raya lucaria academy earlier so that should not be a problem at all just equip one do the gesture and the seal will break and afterwards you will be able to pick up both spells the cannon is a really good burst spell that has a massive aoe radius and can easily take care of big groups of mobs really quickly for you that makes it a very efficient spell that you definitely want to pick up the Gavel is a very nice option for quick melee AoE burst and it also has a stagger built in by the way. Due to the fact that it casts relatively quickly it's a very good way to deal with things that are around you. When things get dangerous you can quickly change the tide of things with this. Either by just one shotting the enemies or by staggering them and giving you an easier time that way. This spell also had one of the biggest FP cost reductions with a whopping 33% decrease after the latest patch. So it's definitely in a very good spot now. Then we want to pick up some more spells. If you have progressed enough in the game you will have unlocked the snowy areas by now and that's great because there's a really good spell out there that we want to pick up as well this is the meteorite of Astle spell this spell can be found in the yellow annex tunnel the nearest grace to this cave will be the inner consecrated snowfield grace so just head there and then go to the west till you arrive at the cave when you finish you will have to fight a pretty large boss but you can do it i have faith in you and when you kill it it will give you the spell it's an incredible spell, mainly you will want to use it versus big targets so all of the meteorites will be guaranteed hits. And in those cases it will just decimate any enemy within a second or so and you can do 10k damage easily in that second. And it's even better for us by the way because the spell is purple and that means it's a gravity spell and will deal a whopping 30% extra bonus damage on top of the insane damage that it already does for us due to our dual wielding staff setup. Now that we have a bunch of great new powerful spells, let's also take a look at the recent changes to the spells in the game. A lot of previously useless spells have been buffed and some of them are definitely a nice alternative option now. I already mentioned the buffs to the Gavel of Hema and Runes of Star spells which were great. Both of Loretta's spells have also been buffed now and that's great because they will cost less FP now. And if you watched my previous videos then you know that I already thought the Great Bow in particular was a very good spell that you want to pick up early and now it's even better so that's great news. I think the Great Glintstone Shard got a very relevant and great buff as well. It was definitely already a viable spell but now it has a crazy range as well and the projectile that you shoot travels faster so in many cases you will apply damage more consistently now. With this buff I think it will be the new Glintstone Pebble and definitely a great option for you to consider using for that slot instead of the Glintstone Pebble spell. 
Combat charge has also been buffed, but you have to charge it every time for it to reach its true potential. It's definitely a lot better now, but the whole casting and then charging and then casting and then charging and so on and so on can be a bit of a negative because you won't always get the opportunity to actually do so. I still prefer Rock Sling over these two spells to be honest. Next to the fact that the dual wield setup with Meteorite Staff makes it deal massive damage, it also has the Poise Break built in that will just make many bosses collapse for you. And that's a really useful feature that it has because it sets up a nice way to then deal a lot of extra damage for free for a good portion of the fight. And you can do that multiple times in a singular fight. We also need to talk about Crystal Barrage because this thing had a major turn up. It probably went from being one of the worst and most useless spells in the game to now actually dealing really good damage. And add to that that it also staggers your enemies and has a very decent FP cost. There is a problem though, we have so many good spells now, especially all the ones that we already picked up, that it's just simply not going to fit our memory slots. And rather you'll just want to have several rosters to play with all of them and probably determine which ones you will use depending on the area you're in or the boss you're going to face or just simply the ones that you find the most fun to use. For the most optimal gear I have made a standalone video where I go over every armor set in the game and what kind of armor you would want to wear as a mage. I will put the link for that in the description so definitely check that out. Just one additional thing, I do wear the Queen's Crescent Crown because I have exactly 77 intelligence. So I just used it to get those 3 extra points to get to 80, get soft capped and then the helmet has no trade off whatsoever and doesn't weigh a lot so in my opinion it's a nice option to use it like that. But if you're already 80 plus you probably will want to wear one of the other helmets I go over in that video. Regarding the staff we went over it in part 2 and I definitely still think the same way i used my carrion regal scepter all the way till the end game and it's definitely the best all-round staff in the game it has no bad trade-offs like the lucid staff it's efficient its scaling is really good at plus 10 and it's the highest in the game if you don't consider staffs with trade-offs and the staff becomes especially good after 70 intelligence it boosts full moon sorcery and without joking its weapon art is actually really good as well and i did not even realize it last time nor did i mention it but it's a very effective way of dealing with enemies that are literally on you you have no time to really cast anything or you want to just save FP, then just use the spinning weapon and it will do a very good job at keeping the enemies off of you. Let's also talk about talismans. Now that we are in the late game, we get a few new great options to consider. You definitely want to pick up the Graven Mass Talisman that you can find in the snowy mountainous areas again, exactly here on the map. To break the seal on the tower you will need to have the fanged imp ashes summon. If you don't have them then you can just simply buy them at the merchant next to the Raya Lucaria academy. When you summon your imps to fight the other imps in the area the seal will break and you can enter and pick up the graven mass talisman. And this thing is amazing it's one of the best sorcery related talismans in the game. It adds 8% extra damage and it stacks as well with its little brother the graven school talisman that we picked up at the academy now there are always preferences when it comes to talismans whether for example you want to be more defensive have more utility or simply just have more damage but in my opinion this is a really great selection that gives us a bunch of extra relevant stats and three levels with reticon sword seal 12% increased damage with the stacked graven talismans and we also cast faster with the reticon icon talisman so in every department we're covered and we also don't have any penalties from wearing these talismans. As we talked about it last time, the vigor that you get from Radicon's source seal offsets the penalty that this talisman gives. So it does not have an actual penalty for us. I do have flex around the plus 4% increased damage little brother Graven talisman with other stuff here and there. For alternative options you might as well consider using the Earth Tree Favor plus 2 talisman that you can pick up in the capital. But you can only pick this up when you're pretty much in the end game. And this talisman really gets better the more vigor and endurance you have. Cerulean Ember Medallion plus 2 starts getting decent if you have at least 50 or 60 mind. Before that don't even bother with it, it will be pretty much worthless. And Magic Scorpion Charm is also a decent alternative if you don't mind the 10% increased physical damage that you will take from it. Finally there's one more thing to consider which is our summon. Now what's more powerful than one powerful mage? Two powerful mages of course. With this summon on your side you will have a tanky companion that's also going to deal good damage considering it's just going to exactly copy your spell so it's 100% a summon that you will want to pick up. Even with the nerfs the mimic tier is still the best in my opinion. It was the best summon in the game by far no matter your class before and it's still definitely top tier. To be honest I barely notice any difference with mimic tier compared to before the recent patch so I'm 100% still using it. If you don't have it you can get it in Nokron which you will have visited earlier with Rani's quest chain and just make sure you have a stone sword key with you. Then go to the ancestral woods grace point, start walking over the roof, 
jump down, go to the right, jump down to the other platform, then basically just keep jumping down and move towards the courtyard right here. At the courtyard, take the sneaky path to the left right here, then keep moving forward till you get to the broken bridge, cross the broken bridge and jump down the window. Now take a left again and keep moving forward till you're at the stone sword gate, use your key there and now you can go and pick up your mimic tier. With all of these things combined, we have completed our goals and we really have an extremely powerful build now. Using this build will guarantee you success in the late game, in addition to completely destroying the early and mid game when you follow my previous videos. You will destroy the late game, and the journey from being a weak mage that spams Clintstone Pebble all game long to becoming the ultimate mage with optimal gear, optimal equipment, optimal tools and many many powerful sorceries has been completed. If you were entertained by these videos, or they helped you out in any way, or you found any source of utility in these videos, but you are not subscribed yet, then consider doing that, as this is really only the start of greater things to come.